All right. So as I mentioned today, I'm just going to do a little kind of overview on my view on what the bride of Christ is. Okay. So it's interesting. And this is just like an interesting story in the Old Testament. We have this story of a man named Jacob. Jacob would later be named Israel. And of course, he deceived his brother and ran away because he was worried his brother was going to kill him once his parents died, once his dad died specifically. So he ran away back to his mother's home. And when he's there, he falls desperately in love with his cousin, particularly this young lady named Rachel. Um, as weird as that is, you know, based on our stories, our understanding of, you know, uh, incest and things like that today, back then it would be considered acceptable and actually favorable to keep, to marry someone within your own background. Okay. Jerry, yeah, he married his cousin. That's right. Um, so anyways, he goes back and he's serving his uncle. And while he's working for him, his uncle's like, listen, I got to pay you something. What are your wages going to be? So he agrees. He's like, you know what? I'll give up the best years of my life if you give me my cousin here, Rachel, to marry. I'll give up whatever I need to give up. So they agree that seven years is considered an appropriate amount to give up for this lady. So for seven years, he works, he toils, he sweats, he does everything he needs to do to get this woman. He doesn't, the amount of sacrifice doesn't bother him. The Bible says it was as if a few days. All that sacrifice didn't matter why because of the great love he had for this woman okay and then comes the wedding night and the master of the bride the one who owns her her father switches him up he gives her the the bride he never came after okay and he ends up marrying leah her sister the sister of the bride he wanted and of course he's like what just happened right <laughs> he woke up the next morning after consummating the marriage, he's like, what just happened here? What have you done to me? And of course, he's like, listen, oh, here's the reason. Oh, we're supposed to marry the older one first and gives this, you know, nonsensical, nonsensical answer because he knew the deal that was made. So he says, I'll tell you what, spend a week with Leah, seven days, and then I'll give you Rachel too. You'll have them both, but you got to give a week to Leah first. So she spends seven days, then he marries Rachel, another wedding happens, and then seven more years he's required to work to pay off the price of both women, okay? Just an interesting story. What does that have to do with the bride of Christ? Well, I think it is interesting that Jesus Christ came to this earth, and he came to this earth and was seeking after the Jews. I'm not going to get in too, too detailed or go through all of the Bible verses that speak of Israel being the bride of God, as the Bible talks about it, being like a wayward bride, going through a divorce, all these different things, committing adultery with other gods, and things of that nature. But there's all kinds of imagery like that throughout the Old Testament. But Jesus came here, whenever they ask him, any Gentile would ask him, hey, why don't you come help me out? Or why don't you, you know, heal my kid or do this? He said, hey, I'm here for the children of Israel. I'm here for Israel. I'm here for Israel. And then finally, when Israel rejects, not that he didn't care about the others, but he said, I'm here for Israel and all of his sacrifice, no problem. But then whenever Israel was offered, hey, will you accept your king? Crucify him, right? They rejected him. Their leaders rejected him. And afterwards, when they rejected him, the Bible's very clear, even in the book of Acts, where it talks about how God will go to the Gentiles and establish for himself a people that will be by his name. And after this, this is in Acts 15, He'll return and set up the tabernacle of David, and he will reign from a kingdom and restore the remnant of Israel, as we read in the book of Romans and some allusions in Hebrews and things like that. So there is this idea in this image, this story of Jacob, of Jesus coming for his church. I'll get to one second. Um, but then ending up, because of rejection, having to spend some time with this other church. And I believe, which we'll talk about a lot more down the road, about the rapture in a period of at least seven years that he spends with his bride and then returns for those he originally came for, the remnant of Israel. Go ahead, sir. What's that? Well, some of us. <laughs> <laughs> some of us are. Um, so the Bible is very clear that we need to consider what the church is. You know, it's definitely no question the body of Christ. But we also have these statements, which 
again, the words bride of Christ, not in the Bible. Okay. But there are a lot of statements about the bride of the lamb. There's a lot of statements about the, uh, how Jesus and the church is like a man and his bride. So we're going to kind of go through those hopefully briefly here. So in Colossians 1.18, it says, and he, Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. No question. The body is the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things we might have the preeminence. So according to the Bible, the church is the body of Christ. Again, in Colossians 1.24, who now rejoice in my sufferings with for you, this is Paul speaking, and fill up that which is behind of the affliction of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake. Paul was suffering for who? For his body. And then he says, which is the church? Nobody can argue. The church is the body of Christ. So what is the church? You know, is it everyone who's in a church? Oh, I belong to this church. I belong to that church. Or is it people who have truly accepted Jesus Christ as their savior? Well, Jesus tells us who his church is. It's those who are built upon the foundation that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. That's what's necessary to be part of Jesus's church. Matthew 16, verse 16 says, and Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my father, which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the absolute rock of the foundation of the church of Christ is Jesus and the fact that he is the Messiah. Now, some people say, well, wait, isn't it Peter that's the rock? Well, ask any Christian right now, what is the foundation of your salvation? I don't care what denomination you're in. They will tell you it's Jesus Christ. So either they're saying if, Peter, if Jesus meant it was Peter, then they're saying Jesus was incorrect, or we're misunderstanding to say that Peter was the rock. No, the foundation of what Peter said, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God, is the foundation for all Christendom. Every person who's ever called themselves a Christian has to acknowledge this, right? Romans 10, 9, Paul agrees with this. He says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Paul tells us what the foundation of Christianity is. So everyone who's on this rock is part of the church, makes you part of the body of Christ. What about this bride of Christ? And again, some people believe based on verses about us being grafted in, about us being represented and how, gee, how that original branch, we shouldn't be prideful against it. These are all in Ephesians 1.10 and Romans 11.17 down through 19 is saying that perhaps the bride is Israel. And there is no question at all, at all, that in the Old Testament, there's tons of imagery about Israel being the bride of God. It says in Jeremiah 314, turn, O backsliding Judah, or excuse me, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. I, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I'll bring you unto Zion. But unfortunately, if you read in Deuteronomy 24, it talks about the laws of divorce, talks about if a woman is unfaithful, that she'll be given a, a writing of divorce, right? And that's exactly what the Bible tells us happened to Israel in Isaiah 50, verse 1, in Jeremiah 3, verse 8, Jeremiah 3, verse 20. So we have to acknowledge that Israel, particularly Judah, was to be the bride of God was to be the bride of God, and that was the plan. And then, unfortunately, they walked away, not because he wanted them to walk away, not because he rejected them. They rejected him. They rejected God, okay? Now, God, despite their rejection, which you can read about in Ezekiel 16, 2, God chose to remain with Israel and still send him his Messiah, as he had promised. In Ezekiel 16, 28, it says, Thou hast played the whore also with the Assyrians, because thou wast unsatiable, thou hast played the harlot with them, yet you could not be satisfied. Thou hast moreover multiplied the fornication of the land of Canaan unto Chaldea, yet thou wast not satisfied. But he says in Ezekiel 16, verse 8, Now when I passed by thee and looked at thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. I spread my skirt over thee. God says, I still, despite all of your sins, 
I still spread my protection, my love over you, okay? And he goes on to talk about how he entered a covenant with them despite their failings. The book of Hosea, the entire marriage of the poor man Hosea was to a harlot who was unfaithful to represent God's relationship with Israel, okay? And you can read all about that. So though Israel had rejected God, God did not accept the divorce. He did not accept that they would be gone and they would leave forever. He's going, back, he's going to work with them. He told them how much time he has left to work with them till he comes to reign. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, he says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, the people of Israel, and upon thy holy city, representing Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation. You were going to fix all this reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and prophecy. All the prophecies will be brought together at the end of this period of time and to anoint the most holy and the fulfillment of all these things, right? So 69 weeks of years would pass until the Messiah came. But there's one more week of years, one seven year period at least that has to yet happen where he continues to deal with Israel. So even Orthodox Jews, right, who don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, they still believe that God is the God of the Old Testament, which he is the God of the Old Testament, because there is no difference. They are both Jesus Christ and the Father and the Spirit. But the Orthodox Jews, they haven't completely turned their back on God. But what about the majority of Israelites today? The vast majority of Jews today are secular they're atheistic okay that doesn't mean they don't have judeo-christian values but they do not believe in the god of the bible so despite israel's problem with other gods throughout history she always remains his bride okay she was a harlot but he was still her husband so in ezekiel 16 32 he says but as a wife that committeth adultery which taketh strangers instead of her husband he was still her husband Jeremiah 3.1 says, they say, if a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man, shall he return unto her again? That was the law. If, she, if you divorced her and you're done, she can't come back to you. Shall not the land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. <clears throat> if you ever see one of God's laws not being fulfilled as we understand it, you can bet every dollar it's on the side of mercy. It's always on the side of being merciful to us. It's always that way. Jeremiah 3.14 says, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city. He wants to be married. He wants that relationship restored. And of course, we, go, we see that in the New Testament. In Romans uh, 9, verse 27 it says, Isaiah, or Isaiah, also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Okay? And we're getting to the church here. So don't worry. We'll eventually get there. So that's what you see in the Old Testament. You see a restored Israel and a regenerated earth with a kingdom set up. The kingdom that was promised to Israel, to David, and to those who stayed faithful. Faithful. The world will one day, this world, not a new world, this world will one day be full of the knowledge and glory of the Lord. Numbers 14, 21 says, but as truly as I live, if you believe your God is alive, you have to believe this statement. All the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Amen. Isaiah 11, verse 9 says, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You believe there's water in the ocean? Then you got to believe Jesus will reign on this earth, okay? So Israel has been promised to be fulfilled. The promise is given to Israel. Israel was set apart, and it's going to be fulfilled in a messianic kingdom where they rule the world under their king, okay? But they're held to a different standard to achieve all this, right? There's all kinds of laws in the Old Testament and continued on through the New. These aren't about salvation. Salvation is only through the blood of Christ, right? But this has to do with the millennium, okay? Where their positions and their, a lot of their prophecies are fulfilled. Read all the prophecies from the prophets. 
And you're going to find all these things about how people are going to come to the Jews and ask them, how do we worship your God? And they're going to go with them to Jerusalem and go with them to the feast. These are all fulfilled during the millennium. Okay. Daniel chapter seven, verse 27 says, and the kingdom and dominion and gr the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So there's going to be a remarkable city during the millennium. This where it gets a little bit confusing for a lot of folks. There is a city during the millennium and an amazing temple during the millennium. It's massive. I mean, you can't even begin to understand the dimensions of this bigger than most cities. You think about just the temple that's described in Ezekiel and God will rule the world from this Jerusalem. Okay. But that temple is not present in the new Jerusalem, in the new heavens and a new earth, in eternity. So there is a temple during the millennium, but there is no temple in a new Jerusalem down the road. So we begin to see some differences. So in Hebrews 11, verse 10, we have the statement, for he looked for a city, talking about the faithful, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. The faithful look to see this kingdom set up. And the city with the Messiah reigning. Hebrews eleven fifteen. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out where they used to be, they might have had an opportunity and have returned. But they desire a better country. The faithful Jew was looking for something better where God was going to provide them a better country. That is a heavenly one. Wherefore, God's not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared them a city. And we already talked about in Daniel 7 and 18, where it says the saints of the most high shall take the kingdom. Okay. So there's a kingdom waiting for Israel. So if you look at the promises of the Old Testament, there's overwhelming evidence that Jerusalem will be the capital of the world. Yes. Jesus will reign. There will be a temple. There will be a city. And Israel will be ruled by the 12 apostles. And they will be the uh, envy of the world. People will want to be like Israel is. Okay. All the millennial reign and with the offspring of Abraham. Remember, Abraham, he's the father of Israel, but he's also the father of the faith. Do you ever notice the difference where it talks about the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky? Mm -hmm. Is there a difference there between a millennial reign and eternity? A spiritual children, right? And the physical children, the sands of the sea, earthly, spiritually of heaven. There's, there's something there, but we'll, we'll, we'll save that for another time. So what do we find in the New Testament? That's the Old Testament. That's the original plan for Israel, right? What about that time period that interrupted that 69th week where the Messiah came and was cut off, but not for himself, for us? And the 70th week, which is going to come. This time that Paul calls the time of the Gentiles, the fullness of the Gentiles, this time of the present dispensation of grace, the, the Bible talks about. It's a time when Jews and Gentiles are being saved and are part of the church. Now, the vast majority is Gentile, but there are some Jews that were accepted, especially in the early church. Now, again, some people want to separate this. This is not the view I hold, but many good, solid Christians think that when we talk about the body of Christ, those are all believers. And when we talk about the bride of Christ, these are the believers who live spiritually, who turn their lives and accept Christ. And we talk about them in the New Testament, and particularly the letters of Jesus to the seven churches, as overcomers. And then they're the ones who are raptured. This is the view some hold. This is not the view I hold, okay? So they talk about those who enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, giving up a lot of the inheritance and the promises given in the Bible. And there's a lot of evidence in the Bible that we do have inheritance and that we can lose inheritance, not lose salvation. And no one, no one who follows the Bible is going to argue that. But we can talk about losing salvation and the things we can enjoy, right? So here we have a church in the Bible. And this is going to be my, the reason why I hold the view I do. There's one particular church that Paul writes letters to that is particularly more carnal than any other church. I find the church of Corinthians to be one of the most carnal churches in the Bible. They have a lot of good features, but this is just the, you know, the way I look at it. But what does he tell them? He says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, for I am jealous over you with a godly, with godly jealousy. Why is he jealous over them? For I have espoused you to one husband. You're betrothed, people. You're betrothed to one husband. 
that I may present you as a chaste virgin. When I present you, when it comes time to present you, I want you to be a chaste virgin. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So he's speaking to believers in Corinth says, listen, you guys are having all these corrupt teachers. You're living very carnal lives, but don't you know you're betrothed to Christ? Don't go follow what they're teaching. He considers them, in my view, the bride of Christ. Jesus says he is the husband of the body, right? So he's, remember, Paul called the same group in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, you are the body of Christ. So this body of Christ is at least, we can agree, engaged or betrothed to Jesus Christ, right? There was a plan for them to certainly be the bride, but they're not yet married. It's something that happens yet future. If I introduce my, this is my fiance, what does that imply? We have not yet married. This is something that's going to yet happen future. And you're going to find the marriage supper of the lamb is prior to the second coming when he returns to earth. It's before the second coming when he returns for Israel. So there is a reunification of Old Testament believers, but there's also, it's separate from the unification of the church to Jesus, okay? Revelation 19, seven says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, to Jesus, for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. Later in that chapter, he comes down riding his white horse and conquers the world and overthrows the Antichrist, and redeems Israel, and all these other things. So he put down who he's going to marry, and when you're going to marry someone in the olden days, you'd make a bargain with the family, and they would tell you, I need a dowry. You have to give me a thousand bucks. They say, okay, where's your down payment? Show me that you're serious about this. We still use the word today, earnest money. If you're going to buy a home, you got to say, hey, Here's a thousand bucks as my earnest money or 5,000 bucks to prove that I'm dead serious about this, right? So what's our earnest money? What's our down payment? Well, guess what? It's the Holy Spirit. Jesus paid for us on the cross. He will redeem this entire planet. It will be, it's coming. He already put the down payment on it. We're bought, we're bought and paid for, it. but he has to redeem. He has to build the house, right? He has to redeem the world. So it says in Ephesians 1.13, in whom you also trusted Jesus after you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after you believe, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So faith leads to sealing by the Holy Spirit, which is the earnest, or the down payment, of our inheritance until the redemption, how long will it go? Until the redemption of the purchased possession. When it comes time to redeem the earth, that's whenever we're there. When does the wedding happen? After the seven seals are broken. What is, what is being opened? What is the scroll? I believe it's the deed of all of creation. It is the redemption of the entire universe, right? We'll talk more about that down the road. But the mm -hmm. possession is purchased already. We're just waiting on FedEx to deliver the package, right? We actually purchased it. We already made the payment. It's guaranteed. So the down payment's been placed. So as we mentioned before, Jesus is our espoused husband, though the marriage has not yet taken place. Remember, Joseph and Mary had a similar situation. Notice the terminology the Bible uses. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ this is Matthew 1, 18 and 19. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, they weren't married yet, before they came together, she was found with child of Holy, the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, they weren't married yet, but they were fully considered, or he was, he was considered her husband being a just man, not willing to make her a public example. And it goes on from there. So the earnest has been paid. The deal is sealed. Okay. They were husband and wife before the marriage and before they ever came together. We are the bride of Christ, according to Paul in Romans. What does he say in Romans? Romans 7 verse 4 says, wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. We die to the Old Testament law that you should be married to another. Uh-oh, so I'm no longer under the law. Why? So I can be married to someone else, even to him who is raised from the dead. So Romans, written to Gentile believers in Rome, says you are free from the law and you are to be married to Christ, the one raised from the dead, that you should bring forth fruit to God. 
okay? So if you've been saved and given eternal life, I see these passages telling us that you have become the bride of Christ. One of the mysteries that Paul received from God is that marriage, right? The marriage relationship is actually designed by God to represent Jesus's relationship to the church, okay? So specifically, marriage was designed originally by having Adam marry himself. Sounds kind of weird, but hey, everything in creation, right? Everything in creation, all creatures, all living beings were made from dirt or water, right? There's only one exception to that rule. Who is it? Eve or Adam, the female version, right? Um, so that's right. Your wife, okay, he married his own flesh. Though she is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. I know that's weird terminology, but follow my thinking here, okay? Male and female he created them, and he called their name Adam. That's exactly right. So whenever it talks about your wife, according to Paul, also it's your own flesh. So what does he say in Ephesians 5.22? Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband's the head of the wife, and Christ is the head of the church. Okay, here's our analogy. Christ is the head of the church, husband's the head of the wife. He is the savior of the body. So the husband-wife is the same as Jesus' church. The body is the body of Christ, the church. And Jesus' relationship to the church is the same as the husband-wife relationship. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ... So let the wives be their own husbands and everything. So without question, Jesus is the savior of the body. The body is the church. And he explains that. So the bride, also in this analogy, again represents the church. So what is the, this was a mystery God had revealed to Paul. But there's an even greater mystery he gives in the same analogy. Continuing on in Ephesians 5 verse 25, he says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ has also loved the church, and gave himself for it. Okay. He gave himself for his bride in the analogy. That he might sanctify it. So what makes this bride suitable to be married? That he might sanctify it. He made it sanctified. Cleansed it with the washing of the water by the word. Why? So that he might present it. It's to be presented to him as a glorious church without spot, without wrinkle, or any such thing that it should be holy and without blemish. Pay attention to these descriptions. They are going to come along when the lamb gets married. So the church, this church was already perfected. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, flesh of my flesh. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord from the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and they shall be joined unto his wife. The two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. Paul's not hiding. This is confusing. I get it. But this is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Christ and the church relationship, the church, which is the body, we've cleared that up, has to do with a husband and a wife, according to Paul. So what is the great mystery? The church is the body. The body is the bride. The only way that you can become the bride of Christ is to be the body of Christ because the two are completely united. The only way you can be suitable to be the bride, right, is because you're the body, because you come from Christ. He is the one that made you without wrinkle, without blemish, without spot. The bride is then presented to Christ. Again, has not happened yet. It's yet future. No question, no question. The bride of Adam was taken from the body of Adam. But even after she was taken out, she was still called Adam, as our brother mentioned. So in uh, Genesis 5, 2, it says, male and female created he them, and he blessed them and called their name Adam in the day they were created. So way back when in Genesis 2, 21, it says the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. He took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto man, unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman or of Adam, of man, right? Because she was taken out of man. 
Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. So literally the only thing in all of creation not made from dirt or water is Eve, okay? She's been made from the man. So they were one being at the creation. God still considered them one being when Eve was created, or she wasn't Eve yet, right? Just because they had two bodies, spiritually at least, God considered them a single being. How did sin enter the world, by the way? What does the Bible say? Through a man, right? Mm -hmm. It says through Adam, but specifically, who was assigned to blame in the Bible? So let me just read Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed on all men, for all have sinned, for until the law was the sin, uh, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam unto Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, whose is the figure of them to come. So again, man, no question. The man was given lordship in the family, right? When did that happen? After the fall. Okay. Genesis 3.16. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. In thy conception, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Okay? So remember, when was she called Eve? After the fall. When sin entered the world, she was just female Adam, right? Woman Adam. And Adam called his wife's name Eve. This is after the fall in Genesis 3.20, because she was the mother of all living. And then in 1 Timothy, we hear about the blame game, right? And Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So this has nothing to do with value in the eyes of God. This is not about a woman and a man being unimportant to God. God says we're not male or female when it comes in Christ, right? But the whole idea here is this relationship between men and women. God sees them as linked and united and inseparable, okay? And the bride of Christ has to come from the body of Christ. When we get to 1 Corinthians 11.8, Paul wants to make it clear. This is not about a sexist thing. He says in 1 Corinthians 11.8, for man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither is the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman. Men can't exist without women. Neither the woman without the man and the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman. And all, but all things of God. It's a tongue twister, right? A lot of information, a lot of man, woman. There. But the, the point that Paul is making is men and women are hopelessly dependent on each other. One cannot exist without the other. The other cannot exist without the one. Okay. The man must have the woman for without a woman, he has no body. He was born from a woman, right? Christ created, this tells us Christ created the bride again from himself. His bride is necessary for him to complete his spiritual body, right? We know that his physical body was resurrected. So just like Adam and the bride of Adam were one being, she was from Adam, but she was united to Adam. So we begin to understand that the body and the bride have to be united because marriage is the unification of a man to his bride, and they become one body. Matthew, this is from Jesus now, not from Genesis. Matthew 19, verse 4, he answered and said unto them, they're trying to test him about how this relationship is. He says, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave, inseparable. Cleave means to be closer than you can be. Cleave to his wife and the twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. But therefore, God is joined together. Let not man put asunder. Now, the bride and the body, again, hopelessly connected. God joined them together, and no man can separate. Ignore the clear implications of eternal security. All right? Let's just ignore that. Um, but this is an eternal union. The bride of Christ is found in heaven, remember, before the second coming. So again, Revelation 19, 7, we talked about how the bride made herself ready. And in verse 8, it says, and to her was granted, 
that she should be arrayed in fine linen. Remember that promise to the church about how she was sanctified and purified without wrinkle, without spot, without blemish? That's the church. The body was said to be the bride there. And here we see she's arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the white linen is the righteousness of the saints. Wait, my righteousness comes from where? From me? It comes from Christ. He did it. And he said unto me, write, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. So what does the bride do? She comes with him at the second coming. And this is, which is described after this bride is presented. Okay, this happens later in the chapter. He then returns to the earth, restores the remnant of Israel, and that's all in Revelation 19. You can read about it. And we then see a resurrection of the Old Testament believers. And remember back when we were talking about Paul's teachings in Galatians, we talked about how the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, was represented by Hagar, and it represented the Jerusalem on the world now. There's a New Testament represented by Sarah but it represents a new Jerusalem, a heavenly Jerusalem, something different than the Jerusalem in the world now. And we won't read it for the sake of time. But if you want to be a part of the new Jerusalem, according to Paul, again, she's the mother of us all. The mother of all believers is the new Jerusalem. That specific verse is in uh, Galatians 4.26. But Jerusalem, which is above or heavenly, is free, which is the mother of us all. So that includes all believers in the New Testament, according to Paul's connection. So let's see what exactly we know about the New Jerusalem. Well, it says in Revelation 21, verse 2, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Interesting. Interesting. Revelation 21, verse 9, we skip down seven verses here, it says, and there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Remember, who prepared the bride of Christ? Who sanctified it, cleansed it, washed it without blemish? Jesus Christ from his body, right? So the bride of the lamb is coming down from heaven. And John seems to think it's a building. Paul seems to think it's people, right? So we have this question. She's presented again before the second coming. So Paul is symbolically talking about rewards in heaven back in 1 Corinthians. But let's hear what he has to say. What does he say in 1 Corinthians 3.9? For we are laborers together with God, and you are God's husbandry. You are God's building. Okay, so follow that for just a minute. You're God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation. Paul wrote the New Testament, a lot of it, laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed, that includes all of you, how you build thereon. So every single Christian who is part of God's building is adding some construction materials to the building. What are the construction materials? 1 Corinthians 3, 11. Now, this is why I say the bride is part of this, including the carnal Christians during the church age. For other foundation can no man lay, this is a continuation of 1 Corinthians 3, can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Okay, solid. We agree. If anyone... As Jesus is their foundation, they're builders. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, you can contribute what you like, right? Every man's work shall be made manifest. It's going to, what does it mean? If I said, hey, make manifest, that means show me what you have. So it's, it shall be made manifest. Again, I'm not trying to be super hyper literal here, but just consider it for a minute. Shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and that fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he has built thereon, he shall receive a reward. Okay, good Christians, spiritual Christians, build up your precious metals and your precious stones. That's what you can bring. Not so good Christians, says your work shall be burned, and you shall suffer loss, 
but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So those who are bringing poor works, poor construction materials, they're not lost, but their materials are all lost. But those who bring the good works, the precious metals, precious stones, that will be allowed in this building that God is building. So no corruptible materials. So let's see what exactly we know about New Jerusalem. Revelation 21, 18. The building of the wall was of jasper. The city was of pure gold, like unto clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, tenth a chrysophis, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every, and every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was of pure gold, and it was a transparent glass. How interesting. What can you contribute? You're a building, and you're filled with precious metals and precious stones, and here's a building made of precious metals and precious stones. Just interesting, right? What is, promise, what the, what is the promise Jesus made? He said in John 14, 2, for in my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus told us he's going to prepare a place full of mansions, a building, right? Paul taught that your good works build upon the foundation of Jesus, and they will be made manifest. He even described the building materials. We see them essentially in this new Jerusalem. Now, again, this new Jerusalem is called the bride of the Lamb. What is the symbolism we've had to those overcomers from the church? These precious stones and precious metals are over all of it. Some people may say that's a little bit of an overreach. Maybe it is. I'm not trying to say that you have to agree with everything I'm saying. But do you see the, uh, the connection of all this imagery? You are the building of God. And on top of that, there's more. You are also called the temple of God as the church, are you not? So in Ephesians 2.19, he says, Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners. And this is speaking again to all Christians, carnal and spiritual but fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Old Testament, New Testament. The church is built upon it, right? Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are built together for a habitation, a dwelling place of God through the spirit. So we know that the law and the prophets were up until John. And then after that, we've seen the kingdom of God come in, right? Into our hearts. And then we're going to see it come down to the earth. So when do you hear, what do you hear about the new Jerusalem? We know the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, right? So when do we hear about the new Jerusalem? What is its foundations? What are its gates, right? Why is there no temple in it? It is the temple. Because it's the people. Just like the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and has no need of a temple because God dwells with them, we read more about New Jerusalem, Revelation 21 12. And it had a wall great and high and had 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So the law and the prophets are there. That was a part of the way in, right? And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the name of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. What was the church built on? The, the law and the prophets. What's the new Jerusalem built on? The law and the prophets, right? As well as the apostles, excuse me. And what do we see missing from that church? There's no temple. It is the temple. It says in Revelation 21, 22, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. So they dwell there without a temple. This is, this is not the millennium. This is not the millennium. This is eternity. Okay. So the pattern is that there is a new Jerusalem in eternity. Everything about new Jerusalem matches imagery of the church, both those that were good and those that were not. And then we see that not everyone in eternity lives in the new Jerusalem. That may disturb some people, but this is what it says. Okay. It's only for the bride. The entire massive city is for the bride, and there's a world of nations that dwell outside of it. 
Revelation 21, 24 says, and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor to it. And the gates of it shall not be shut all the day and night. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations to it. So whatever the bride of Christ is, God's dwelling there. And I believe the bride of Christ is clearly taught in the Bible to be the church. It's dwelling in this new Jerusalem. And it's the temple. It's the, whole, the stones, everything. But there's a whole world of, uns of people who get saved that do not live there. That's what you said about if you go into the Hilton or whatever. Yes, yeah, different between inheriting it yeah. or visiting it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are going to be a whole bunch of people saved after the rapture. There's going to be people resurrected at the second coming. There's going to be a lot of people who get saved during the millennium, all right? There's going to be people who reject Jesus at the end of the millennium and are judged. But the Bible's clear that there will be many outside of the church who inhabit eternity. Second Timothy, and this is my last statement here. I know everybody's, we're a little bit behind schedule. Second Timothy chapter one, verse nine says, who has saved us, who has called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. So God called us, not because we did anything that was good enough to get us called, he called out, he called all men. He wants everyone to be saved. This is not a Calvinistic approach. Here. I'm simply saying that God called us for a purpose outside of just ourselves. What was the purpose? It says the purpose was given us in Jesus Christ before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Ephesians 3 9 says, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery so all of the living creation the mankind see what's the fellowship of the mystery what is the unification what brings together this whole mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hidden god god has had a plan that has been hidden before the earth began who created all things in jesus christ to the intent what was the purpose that all principalities and powers, for we already said mankind, now all of creation, spiritual, angels, fallen angels, you name it, everything in heavenly places might be known by the church, by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So the mystery of all history, a little rhyme there, mystery of all history is not that the Gentile church is an afterthought. Not I won't say Gentile, that the church is an afterthought when Israel refused. They were the purpose of all creation. Yes, Israel was given the glory to bring that Messiah in the world. And the Israel was the first one invited to be part of that church. And they will not be forgotten either. But the purpose of all of creation and all of history is the bride of christ that is the reason for everything that's for me and i believe that's for you and i believe that's for anyone who's accepted jesus christ now again that's the for all creation to see what god wanted in creation they need to understand so again when historically someone is courted if i want to date you if i want to marry you i go and i talk to those who are in power i say hey your dad I want to marry your daughter. Um, and he'll say, well, here's the requirements. Here's what it costs. Here's what it's whatever. It is completely on the man. In today's world, we make the parents of the bride pay for a lot of it. That's not how it was. It was all the burden was on the man. The groom had to come and pay everything. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. And the bride simply has to Accept and come to the wedding. I do. That's it. What did you say about the dowry, though? So the dow the man had to pay the dowry. The man paid the dowry, the, the groom. Yes. So whatever the cost was to redeem this woman, to purchase her from the father, the groom was willing to pay it. That is the mystery of all creation and all history. And I think it's a... Uh, wasn't the bride It was the man with Mm -hmm. And the thing is also, just keep in mind, this is one last statement, and I'm going to stop here, and then we'll continue talking for those who want to stick around. The groom and the bride, or if you want to go for it, the body and the bride, are both at the same wedding. 
they are completely inseparable. Mm -hmm. And we'll stop there, guys. That's my view on the body and bride of Christ. Uh, Next week, we're going to start actually going through verse by verse uh, of the, uh, uh, the letter to Thyatira. But specifically, one thing to study, and this is probably one of the main things we'll only get through, what is worship? Biblical worship. I don't just want a one-line definition. What does the Bible tell us comprises worship? Okay.